The directional pad input style attempts to mimic one of the oldest of controller input hardware. It applies four buttons in a plus shape to the input hardware just as its namesake implies. These four buttons are all handled as digital inputs. That is to say that they don't recognize how hard you press them, just that they are either pressed or not. Think movement using WSAD rather than movement using a joystick. It doesn't matter how soft you press the W, your character isn't going to walk any slower. This input style can be applied to joysticks, face buttons, directional pads, touch pads, and the gyro. This input style is best used for assigning keyboard movement, like WASD or arrow keys, or for mimicking a real D-pad, though it does have other uses. As usual, timestamps and a link to the script can be found in the description. So let's get to it! The first option, and the most integral to making the style feel right, is layout. This determines how the software interprets intermediate values of the input hardware. That is to say, what happens when your input isn't all the way in a cardinal direction, such as pushing the joystick halfway or pushing towards a diagonal. Our options here are 8-way overlap, 4-way no overlap, analog emulation, and crossgate, with all of them being available to each of the input hardware except the face buttons and directional pads don't have access to analog emulation. 8-way overlap essentially splits the input hardware into an 8-slice pie, with each slice pressing a single button or a combination of two adjacent buttons. For instance, if I put WASD on the touchpad, then I can move in all eight directions that it would afford me. This layout is best used when a game requires that you press two of these buttons simultaneously. First-person shooters and WASD are a great example of this, since sometimes you'll want to strafe while walking forwards or backwards. This layout is also required for fighting games with input commands, like down, down forward, forward punch for a Hadouken, since that diagonal input is required for some special moves. 4-way no overlap splits the input hardware into a 4-slice pie with each slice pressing just a single button. There are no diagonals using this layout. Building off of the last example, if I put WASD on the touchpad, then I can only move in the four cardinal directions. This layout is best used in situations where you would never want two of the bindings pressed together. This makes it perfect for most 2D platformers since you'll mostly be wanting to press only left or right. This is also the layout you'll want to use if you are wanting to perform item management through this input style, like how most controller-based FPS games put weapon swapping on a physical D-pad. Analog emulation does exactly what it sounds like it does. It takes digital input and emulates an analog output. In theory, you could bind WASD to a joystick and utilize the fine movement speed control that most people expect when moving with a joystick. It does this by rapidly tapping the movement keys, like WASD or arrow keys, altering the frequency of the tapping and the length of the tap. Now, this technically works. The algorithm does a decent job of getting the player movement to feel right. However, since the technique is literally rapid button presses, it completely destroys any semblance of natural motion when dealing with animations. Sometimes it's fine, but usually it will look, uh, bad. This layout will mostly be used to get quasi-analog movement out of digital bindings, but it can also be used as a finely tuned set of turbo action, giving you more control over the rapid presses than Steam Input's built-in turbo feature. The only drawback is that every button bound to the input style would utilize the same settings, so you couldn't create different turbo speeds per binding. And lastly is Crossgate, a layout that was removed for some time but added back in when Steam Input branched out to support input devices other than the Steam controller. There is some technical jargon about how it uses four hysteresis detectors rather than one, but all you really need to know is that it works better for real D-pads. The main benefit is that it weeds out unintentional output better for physical D-pads, but the big takeaway is that if you are putting the directional pad input style on an actual D-pad, then use this layout every time. Now that we have looked at the various layouts, we can look at the individual settings. Some of these only pertain to specific input hardware, and some may only pertain to specific layouts, and I'll be sure to mention that sort of information when discussing each setting. First off is Requires Click a touchpad only setting that dictates whether you will need to click or simply touch the pad for the binding to activate. 
While I personally prefer to always have this turned off, the setting is an entirely subjective one and is entirely up to the user preference. Enabling the setting makes it feel more like an actual D-pad. The user will need to apply force to activate the binding and can rest their thumb on the touchpad without sending any input. Disabling it allows the user to activate the bindings without force, which could result in slightly quicker inputs, but could result in accidental presses if the user is used to resting their thumb on the input hardware. Gyro Enable button is a gyro-only setting that dictates when the gyro is activated. This option can be set to Always On or to any button on the controller. If you want your gyro bindings to always be available, then you'll set this to Always On. But if you want them to be disabled sometimes, then set this to one of the controller buttons. If you set a button, then next you'll need to configure the gyro button behavior, which determines what the gyro enable button does. The default is set to on, which will enable the gyro bindings only when your gyro enable button is held. Turning this to off means that your gyro bindings will always be active unless you are holding the gyro enable button. And the final option, Toggle will use the gyro enable button to toggle the activation of your gyro bindings. This setting is best used when you only need your gyro directional pad at certain times. You could set this up to where you hold, let's say, right grip, and then rotate the controller one of the four directions to select weapons, like in the Borderlands series. This allows the user to quickly access their gyro directional pad without having to worry about keeping the controller perfectly still during every moment of gameplay. And the final option in the left column is Overlap Region. This setting is only for the joystick and touchpad and determines how large the diagonal regions are when using the 8-way overlap layout. I think a visual aid will help immensely here. At 50%, each area of the pie is equal taking up one eighth of the available space and sporting a cool 45 degree angle. As you increase this slider, the slices for the cardinal directions begin to shrink while the diagonal direction slices increase. And as you decrease this slider, the cardinal directions enlarge while the diagonal directions shrink. At 0%, you might as well be using the four-way no overlap layout, and at 100%, you'll only input the cardinal directions when you are directly on them. The default for this setting is 85%, which outputs a cardinal direction as long as you are inside of the Steam Controller's left touchpad indent. This works great on the specific touchpad, but I would reduce it a bit for any other input hardware, such as the right touchpad, the DualShock Force touch bar, or a joystick. This is another subjective option, and is entirely about feel. If the diagonal inputs are too sensitive, and you're finding it difficult to only activate a cardinal binding, then decrease it. For the opposite case, increase it. Moving to the right column, mode shift and haptics intensity show up in every input style and are large enough to warrant their own videos, so we'll be skipping them for now. Click action is available to the touchpad and joystick and allows you to add a binding for clicking the input in. If the touchpad's required click setting is enabled, then both the directional pad binding and the click action binding will activate when clicking, so make sure to use this responsibly. Technically, this setting shows up for D-pads and face buttons as well, but it doesn't do anything, which makes sense given that you have to press in either of these input hardware. Being that the directional pad input is mostly targeted at movement bindings, this setting is perfect for binding sprint to clicking in the joystick, though it can also be used for any action that you'll want to do while using the other bindings of the input style. The joystick and touchpad also have access to the dead zone settings. This configures how large the dead zone is on these two inputs. The dead zone is the area at the center of the input that doesn't register. If we imagine a circle at the center of a joystick, then no bindings will activate as long as the joystick is within the circle. For the touchpad, no bindings will activate as long as your thumb is touching a part within the circle. Moving the slider down makes the circle smaller while moving it up makes the circle bigger. This is another setting that is more about user preference. If you feel like your bindings aren't activating as quickly as you like, then decrease it. If the bindings feel too sensitive, then increase it. And the final option in the right column is Gyro Pitch Neutral Angle, which determines where the Y equals zero point is of your gyrometer. More simply put, it determines where the dead zone is when leaning the controller up or down. By default, this is at 50%, which is exactly level. If you place your controller face up on a table, then this is where the no output zone would be. 
If you find that you hold your controller with a slight tilt upward, then you'll want to move the slider to the right. A slight tilt downwards, and you'll move it to the left. Next, we'll look at all the options found in the additional settings section of this input style. This section can get pretty intense, but luckily there are only two features for this input style, which makes it a great introduction to the concept of additional settings, which is mainly extra options that don't necessarily impact the core function of the input style, but can definitely enhance it. The first one I'll discuss is outer ring binding. This is a common setting, showing up in many input styles, so you'll probably be hearing about this one a lot. This allows you to place a binding for when you reach the maximum output of a joystick or touchpad, such as moving your thumb to the edge of the touchpad or pushing the joystick as far as it will go. A good use of this is placing the sprint button here when using movement bindings. This will make sprinting a natural extension of movement. Outer ring binding radius dictates how close to the edge you need to get to activate the outer ring binding. Much like the dead zone option, this one is best visualized with a circle. When the setting is at 0%, the binding will always be activated, and at 100% it will only activate when the joystick is pushed all the way to the edge or the user's thumb is at the very edge of the touchpad. Outer ring binding invert makes it so that the outer ring binding is activated whenever the joystick or user's thumb is within the circle, disabling it when you go past the circle. Technically, this option is also available for the D-pad and face buttons, but since they are digital inputs, this binding will always be activated whenever any button is pressed. For these input hardware, the invert option will make it so the outer ring binding is always activated unless one of the buttons are pressed. And finally, if you choose analog emulation for your layout, then you'll see two slider bars here to control how that functions. Analog emulation pulse time and analog emulation active percent. The pulse time determines how quickly the presses happen. This is no different than setting a turbo mode rate of fire. The description text notes that this is in milliseconds and the conversion is that each percentage of the bar is equal to 5 milliseconds, with the default value of 5.6% or 0.056 as per the tooltip equaling 28 milliseconds. The active percent determines how long the button is held during the pulse time. So if the pulse time is set to 100 milliseconds and the active percent is set to 60% of the bar, then the button will be pressed once every 100 milliseconds and will be held for 60% of that, or 60 milliseconds. So the final output would be held for 60 milliseconds and released for 40, then held for 60 and released for 40, repeating until you recenter the joystick, touchpad, or gyro. The directional pad input style can be used whenever you need access to four digital buttons, but the options definitely indicate that this input style is best used for movement. Its most common uses are for binding keyboard movement, such as WASD or the arrow keys, or for item management, like how Borderlands handles weapon switching or Dark Souls handles potions. Overall, this input style isn't particularly impressive nor revolutionary. It is, after all, replicating one of the oldest input hardwares in gaming's history. But because of this, you'll find that it will have a place in almost every config and is essential when replicating most X-input bindings.